Oh, I'm Michael Vitarelli, and today we're going to talk about fluorescence. In this experiment, we're going to have two ruthenium complexes in different oxidation states. One will be a donor, which can donate an electron. The other, an acceptor, which can accept an electron. Let's first say we have the donor by itself in solution. We hit the donor with a photon and excite an electron. The electron undergoes a spin relaxation and stays in this excited state for about 650 nanoseconds. Uh, keep in mind, let's consider that about a long time, the 650 nanoseconds. All right. After 650 nanoseconds, this excited state electron decays radiatively and a photon comes out. Okay. So now let's say we have the acceptor present. Again, we hit the photon we hit the donor with a photon. We have this excited state electron, there's a spin relaxation, and now this, um, this excited state electron is in this excited state for a long time. Along diffuses the acceptor. If the acceptor diffuses within some proximity of the donor, the excited state electron can hop from the donor to the acceptor. If this happens, the electron will decay non radiably in the acceptor, okay? And light will not be emitted. So the greater the concentration of the acceptor, the less fluorescence we see. We call the acceptor a quencher because it's going to quench the fluorescence. Okay, so now, again, let's say these two species are diffusing about uh, in solution among each other. If, again, if the donor and the acceptor come into some proximity, we are going to assume that the excited state electron will hop instantaneously from the donor to the acceptor. So what's limiting the rate of this uh, reaction is the rate of diffusion of these two species about each other. We call this a diffusion-limited electron transfer reaction. Here are our two species. The first species is our donor. This is ruthenium 2 plus trispiby. The second species is our acceptor, ruthenium 3 plus hexamine. So now I'm going to talk about this old laser kinetics experiment that we don't perform anymore. But understanding this laser kinetics experiment will give us insight onto the fluorescence experiment. All right. In the old laser experiment, we would hit the system, let's just consider the donor, we would hit the donor with a photon, okay, and measure the outcoming uh, photons, okay? Now, these photons wouldn't come out of the system all at once, they would come out in some exponential decay. Furthermore, we measure this at a fixed wavelength, let's say 610 nanometers, okay? So again, we have this monochromatic we're going to only measure the photons coming out of the system at about 610 nanometers. We hit the system, which is, not, which is just a donor with a photon. There's a, uh, the, uh, the electron goes to some excited state. It, there's a spin relaxation, which is a non-radiative decay, and then it hangs up in this uh, excited state for about 650 nanoseconds, and then it decays Radiatively, light comes out at about 610 nanometers. Now again, as mentioned, these uh, photons don't come out all at once. They come out in some exponential decay. So we fit a function, uh, i of t equals i e to the minus t over tau, uh, where t is time. The fit parameter we get out of this, or at least the one we're interested in, is tau, the lifetime. What we actually determined in the old laser experiment was the lifetime of this excitation, this 650 nanoseconds. So what we would get out from this old laser kinetics experiment is this 650 nanoseconds. Okay? Then, continuing with the old laser experiment, we would slowly increase the concentration of the acceptor and get these quencher-dependent lifetimes, okay? Okay, keep all this in mind, and let's talk about fluorescence. Okay, so now, the fluorescence experiment, all of you have done before, but let's talk about what's actually happened here. We see this 
line go across the screen from, let's say, from uh, shorter wavelengths to longer wavelengths. And it doesn't go across the screen uh, instantaneously, it kind of goes across the screen slowly. It looks like it's hanging up at every wavelength for maybe a tenth or a hundredth of a second. Let's say it's hanging up at each wavelength for a hundredth of a second. Okay, so why is it doing that? Well, first of all, there's a time constant that we can set. We can set how long it stays at a given wavelength, all right? So let's say we set the time constant, the machine time constant to a hundredth of a second. Now, for a hundredth of a second, it's going to measure all of the photons coming out of the system at a fixed wavelength. Let's say we're at, let's just say we're at 400 nanometers, okay? So now we hit this, we hit the system with a photon and we measure all the, uh, excuse me, we hit the system with photons and we measure all the photons coming out of the system for a tenth of a second at 400 nanometers, okay? Okay, we do that. We go to 401 nanometers. We hit the system with photons. We measure the photons coming out of the system for a hundredth of a second at 401 nanometers. We do the same thing for 402 nanometers, 403 man nanometers, so forth and so on. So with the old laser experiment, we just measured the outcoming photons at one wavelength. With this fluorescent experiment, we're measuring the outcoming wave, we're measuring the outcoming photons at each wavelength, all right? Again, for the old laser experiment, we measured at a given wavelength for a given number of, t for a, a given time, and we have some exponential decay. Now, basically, what the fluorescence is doing is it's sitting at that, at a given wavelength, and it's basically doing a, it's not an integral, uh, but it's basically a count, a finite sum of all the photons coming out of the system at the corresponding wavelength for a given time. It's analogous to integrating, it's analogous to integrating the intensity um, over time, and uh, that's uh, your fluorescence intensity. If you call the intensity uh, what we got out of the old uh, laser experiment and the fluorescence intensity what we have out of the new experiment, it's analogous to saying that the fluorescence intensity is the time integral of the intensity. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, great. So, now, what we're happening here? Uh, first, first consider just the donor. We hit the donor with a photon, let's say 337 nanometers, and we have this excited state uh, electron on this uh, donor. Without the presence of the acceptor, the, uh, this excited state electron decays and emits a photon of about 610 nanometers. Notice 610 nanometers is not the same as 337 nanometers. Uh, energy is not lost, but again, there's a spin relaxation. So some of that energy goes into, say, vibrational modes, okay? So now let's say there's an acceptor. If there's an acceptor present, the excited state electron from the ruthenium 2 plus, okay, can hop over to the ruthenium uh, 3 plus hexamine, and then the 2 plus becomes 3 plus, and the 3 plus becomes 2 plus. Okay, Jablonski diagrams. So this is a very basic Jablonski diagram on the right here. So again, if you see a squiggly line, that's a non-radiative decay. Light is not emitted. Energy is not lost, it's just going into some other mode, okay? So we have some fluorescence, okay? We hit it with a photon. Um, photons can come out, okay? Maybe they're, maybe come out the same uh, wavelength. But in this case, we're going to hit it with a photon. There's going to be a spin relaxation, okay, to this triplicity. And then we have phosphorescence. Again, phosphorescence is not the same as fluorescence. Phosphorescence, the energy of the outcoming uh, photons is less than the incoming photons, and the wavelength of the outcoming photons is longer. Great, so now let's consider our Jabronski diagram for our experiment here. But uh, first consider, look at this ruthenium. Notice I have my 5D orbitals, but notice I have my six electrons all in the low-lying uh, D orbitals, these three 4D orbitals. I don't have any of my electrons in those 
M and those two higher energetic d orbitals. Why is this? So, um, in previous transition minerals, uh, we've seen splitting in d orbitals, okay? But in this case, ruthenium, the splitting is, uh, for the most part, independent of the ligand, okay? For most cases, ruthenium has this naturally large energy gap between the three low-lying d orbitals and the two higher energetic d orbitals. So it's actually more energetically favorable for the electrons to pair in the low-lying d orbitals than to go to those two higher energetic orbitals. Uh, it's more, again, it's more energetic. So when the electrons pair, there's some penalty due to electron-electron repulsion. But in this case, it's more energetically favorable to, pa to pair than to go to this higher energetic state. This gap between the d orbitals is greater uh, than the energy penalty for electron-electron repulsion. Okay, great. We have this, uh, we have this state here, okay? And let's consider this uh, spin down electron here. Okay, so we hit this state with an electron. Excuse me, we hit this state with a photon. And the electron is excited to uh, this state here. It's still on the metal center. But look, this is spin down and this is spin down. Um, keep in mind, a photon has one unit of angular momentum, while an electron has half a unit of angular momentum. Okay, so uh, spin up to spin down, that's half. And then back to spin up, that's one. Okay, if I start with, say, spin down, okay, I go spin down to spin up, that's a half. And then back down to spin down, that's another half. So half, half is one, okay? Conservation of the angular momentum. All right, so now we have this spin down electron. It's going to decay non-radiatively, the squiggly line. Uh, it will not emit any uh, light, any outgoing photons. And we end up on the ligand, okay? We're no longer on the metal center, we're now on the ligand, okay? So now it's going to hang up in this ligand, it's, excuse me, it's going to hang up on this ligand for about 600 nano, 650 nanoseconds. And then it's going to decay and emit a photon about 610 nanometers. And again, it's going to, the, the, we call this decay phosphorescence because it's at a longer wavelength, uh, lower energy than the incoming photon. Great. Okay, so now let's uh, put these two species together. Again, we have our, our donor, our ruthenium 2 plus trisbipy, and our ruthenium uh, 3 plus hexamine, our, our acceptor or our quencher. Okay, so we hit, this with a, we hit this species with a photon. The excited state electron ends up on uh, the ligand. Okay, so we have this excite, the, again, the star, if you're not familiar with that, uh, the star is an excited state. So we have this excited state here, all right? And we have this, uh, we have this uh, ruthenium three plus hexamine here. If these guys come into some proximity uh, with each other, this guy will end up uh, here, okay? And decay and have decayed non-radiatively. So this, three plus species becomes two plus, and the two plus species become three plus, okay? And this species here has, or begins to quench the fluorescence, okay? Because the decay path here is non-radiative. All right, so stern volmer equation, what are, we, what are we going to calculate, okay? So now, let's consider two rate constants, okay? The fluorescence decay rate uh, let's call it uh, KF, and the KNR, NR, non-radiative K. So these are first order rate constants and have units of one over seconds, okay? Re remember, uh, if it, for second order, for example, we would have units of uh, one over seconds molarity. We'll see that next slide, okay? All right, so the lifetime is the inverse of the rate constant. Okay, so rate uh, lifetime is time. It has units of seconds, while rate constants have units of inverse seconds. Great. Uh, now just keep this in mind, okay? Uh, we'll come back to this in a little bit. This is, again, our intensity from our old laser experiment. I'm gonna just quickly review this because it's important. 
So again, in this old laser experiment, we were just looking at one wavelength and measuring the, uh, let's say, the current created by the photons coming out of the system. But I forgot to say something earlier. So in both the old laser experiment and the fluorescence experiment, what has happened in the instrument? So we hit the system with some photons, and some photons come out of the system. These photons are going to hit a photodiode. This photodiode is going to measure a current, and that, excuse me, and create a current, and that's what we're measuring. Okay? Great. Okay, so now again, our lifetime from our, again, this is our lifetime from our previous slide. We call it, I'm gonna put this zero here, or to indicate no quencher, okay? So this tau zero, uh, this is going to be our 650 nanoseconds, okay? This is uh, this here from our previous side. Now, let's say we have some quencher constant, or quencher present, okay? So now the quenching rate constant is going to be second order, okay? Uh, basically because we have both quencher and donor, okay? So we have to multiply this by the concentration of the quencher for dimensional analysis, okay? So all uh, this here will have one over seconds, one over seconds, and this here will end up with one over seconds, okay? So now we're gonna take the ratio of these two. The ratio, you can do that. Uh, that's some algebra, which you can do. And so the ratio of tau zero to tau, again, tau is the lifetime with quencher is equal to this here. Again, you can just perform that algebra. All right, okay. So now, this is a form of the Stern-Volmer equation, but it's not the form of the Stern-Volmer equation uh, we want. Remember previously, I've said this a few times, that the fluorescence intensity is equal to, or at least analogous to, the integral of uh, the intensity. It's not actually an integral, but it's a finite sum over the intensity, okay? So when you integrate e to the minus t over tau um, dt, you get something that's just uh, proportional to proportional to the lifetime. Okay, so each of these fluorescence intensities is proportional to the lifetimes. Okay, so if you take the ratio of two lifetimes, those are proportional, or excuse me, the ratio of the two lifetimes is equal to the ratio of two fluorescence intensities. Okay, so this. Here is just equal to F0 over F. And that's uh, speaking um, um, plainly, these will just be the heights that you see in your fluorescence graph. We'll see a fluorescence graph uh, next slide. And this right here, this is our Stern-Volmer equation. And um, this will become relevant later. This Stern and Stern-Volmer equation is the same as the Stern layer, as in the Chapman layer in um, membrane surfaces. And we'll talk about that later. Okay, so this is what our data is going to look like. Um, and don't forget to turn the lamp on. Okay, so uh, what is interesting is, which I'll come back to in a little bit, see how uh, you, you take some, you take data, you take many measurements, okay? And you know, these regions are usually all, this region here are usually all lined up, but I have one guy here that's a bit offset from all of these. So, I wanted you to do something anyway, but this is kind of convenient. We're gonna do an interesting um, background uh, subtraction, which I'll talk about next. But before that, see here, this blue guy, this is our first run. This is with no concentration of quencher. This red fellow is our uh, second experiment with some concentration of quencher. More quencher, more quencher, more quencher. Notice as we increase the concentration of quencher, we decrease the fluorescence intensity. Okay, this was some anomaly. All right, so what are we going to do? Again, we're gonna do an unusual background subtraction. This is something you haven't seen before. Our background, we're gonna sum the intensities from 400 to 500 nanometers for each of these individually. Okay, so let's just start with F0, this uh, blue fellow. We're gonna sum the F0 from 400 to 500. And whatever that sum is, you're gonna sum up all those counts from 400 to 500. You're gonna call that F0B. So that's the background associated with your F0, okay? 
Then you're going to sum, again, this blue guy uh, from, 500, from 550 to 650 nanometers, okay? So call that um, F0D, uh, F0 data, okay? Then you're going to subtract uh, your F0B, your background associated with your first run, from your F0D, okay, your data, okay? And that's going to be your F0, okay? So basically, you're going to do that for every five runs. So for each run, you're going to sum up from here to here and subtract it to the, from the sum from here to here. And you're going to do that for each of your five runs. So that's going to give you an F0, F1, F2, F3, F4, okay? Great. So now, how are we going to plot this? This is our stern volmer equation from each side, from the previous slide. We're just going to subtract 1, okay, from this. So this right here, this f0 over f minus 1, that's going to be our y. This is equal to our slope, uh, kq tau 0, times x, okay? That's, excuse me, q, which is going to be our x. So y equals mx, okay? We're going to get a little, we're just going to get a little graph with four points, not five. So the first point will be F0 over F1 minus 1, so that's your y, equals kq tau 0 times the concentration of the, the first amount of quencher, not the zero of 1. Let's consider, the, the, let's consider just having zero quencher. If we have zero quencher, we go to F0 divided by F0 minus 1. Well, that's 1 minus 1 is 0, equals kq tau 0 times 0. So I have 0 equals 0. Don't put five points, okay? The, the zero, zero point isn't physical, okay? So again, your first point is going to be your F0 divided by F1 minus 1, with the X coordinate being the first concentration of quencher, okay? Uh, I think that's point zero zero one uh, molar quencher, okay? All right, so you're gonna have a line with four points and you're gonna get a slope to that. The slope of that is kq tau zero. Tau zero is your, um, zero, your lifetime associated with zero concentration quencher. That's 650 nanoseconds. That's 650 times 10 to the minus nine. So you take this slope, which again, you get kq tau zero, whatever slope that is, you divide that by 650 times 10 to the minus nine and you get kq, okay? That's the, that kq is the wrench, uh, the quenching rate constant, okay? But that's not exactly what we want. That's almost what we want, okay? Now, what we're going to, again, what we're going to assume is that if these two species are diffusing about each other, okay? We're going to assume that if they come into proximity, the, uh, the, electron transfers from the donor to the quencher instantaneously, okay? It's not instantaneously, but we're going to assume it does, okay? So that the rate constant associated with the electron transfer is giant, okay? It's huge, okay? Much bigger than the rate constant associated with uh, the quencher and the diffusion, okay? So since these are inversely proportional to each other, so... Um, your objective, so your, excuse me, your objective is not to get this, well, not to get this KQ, it's to get KD, the diffusion limited uh, rate constant, okay? Since, again, so since these are inversely proportional to each other, 1 over KET, okay, that's the electron rate constant, is going, is going to be practically zero because one, because KET is huge, so 1 over something huge is roughly 0. So we'll approximate this KQ to be KD. That's what we want. We want KD. We want the rate constant associated with the rate of diffusion of these species uh, diffusing about each other. And, you know, I, I work through this out, and you get a value that's pretty close to the literature value. Um, there are some differences between our experiment, our the solvent we use is water, while the solvent for the literature value I have is nitric acid, and their experimental procedure is slightly different. They do a direct, um, 
um, uh, lifetime extraction, similar to uh, the old laser experiment. Well, we're going to do uh, a Stern-Bolmer uh, equation analysis. Uh, so some error there, probably most of the error between the literature value and our value will be associated with a different solvent, water versus nitric acid. Um, okay, so uh, for those that are interesting, interested in, in the notes below, in, this, uh, in the notes in the, below this YouTube video, I'll post the, the manual associated with this and the data associated with this in case anyone from uh, another university would like to try this. Okay, thanks. Bye.